Welcome to the Carbon Stations podcast, where we speak to some of the leading figures in the emerging carbon industry. Our guest today is the founder and CEO of Allied Offsets, Lars Croyer. Lars, thanks so much for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, now, you work with Allied Offsets is uh, without question very fascinating, and we'll certainly get into that in just a bit. But before we do, I'd like to ask you to share a little bit about what you used to do before that. Uh, I know you have a very rich background in uh, in finance as a hedge fund manager and have written several books, one of which has the very intriguing title, Money Mavericks, Confessions of a Hedge Fund Manager. So uh, please uh, do share. Okay. Well, well, first of all, thanks thanks for having me on. Um, very glad to be here. Um, yeah, well, uh, I mean, I can, let me talk a little bit about who I am. I'm, I'm originally Danish, but did all my university and so forth in the U.S. and ended up on Wall Street because I had a lot of debt after university and ended up in the hedge fund world. And so in, um, God, this is like forever ago now, but in 2002, I started a hedge fund in London um, and uh, did that for a while um, before incredibly luckily, frankly, uh, returned capital to investors in early 08 in fact <laughs> january 08 so that was very good timing um and since then i have invested in other hedge funds and sit on the board of a number of them and written a couple of books about uh, finance one as you said i it was actually kind of i didn't pick the title i don't particularly like the title of confessions of a hedge fund manager but uh just the publisher who did that but the whole concept there was like hedge funds was one of these things where Everyone always seemed to think that anyone in the hedge fund drives a red Ferrari and 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 drink thirty thousand dollar bottles of wine and and my reality had been extremely different from that, but also not uninteresting. And I thought it was kind of a cool idea to have a you know how does someone from like a you know a, a, this Danish kid end up running a large hedge fund in London? How, how did that happen? And I was able to tell that story as a in the first person. So that's how I ended up writing the book, and yeah, that was that. Um, and then I wrote a second book because the first one ended up doing quite well, and there's there sort of a separate thing. I've always been very interested in. This is where people typically fall asleep, but I've always been very interested in optimal portfolio theory and how that relates to, um, you know, kind of like how should you know my mom or how should uh, non-finance professionals investor their money, how does that jive with like, what does the theory say and how does that interact with it, with the, with the real world? So I wrote a book about that and yeah, so that, that's sort of, and then a third one after that was very related to the second one. But um, yeah, so that was that. So then um, just an interesting tool for some I still sit on the board of a number of, of, of uh, investment companies. Um, but Allied Offsets then was a uh, complete case of uh, kind of, serendipity really we i wanted to get involved and sounds so grandiose i don't particularly like the term but i wanted to get involved with poverty eradication and we started um this company called allied crowds and originally we were trying to aggregate all the charitable and well and also non-charitable but charitable, main charitable crowdfunding sites in the developing world so sort of saying well there should really be a meta site of sorts um but that business evolved into really doing technology solutions and um, uh, sort of big data solutions for the likes of the World Bank, the UN. Um, actually, our largest client for a while was the Islamic Development Bank Fund. And so it went to some pretty interesting places. But then about uh, three, four years ago, um, we completely randomly started looking at the voluntary carbon credit market. And... Just frankly, we were doing a project for UNCDF, which is a part of the United Nations, um, in West Africa. And I remember there was a coup in Burkina Faso, which is a particularly unhappy country in West Africa. And I remember reading that there were these things, carbon credits that were still being sold into Western Europe and North America and thinking, there's just no way. Like, this is not like a place that exports a lot of stuff, much less a valuable intangible asset during the midst of a coup and civil war. So I started looking into what on earth are carbon credits. And then um, like everyone else, we started with asking the, the first question that everyone asked, like how can a ton of carbon in some places cost $1 and other places cost $500 and what's a registry, what's a verifier? 
how do these things get sold? How do you prove that you only sell, you know, the number that, that, that you say you sell? How do you know that a ton is a ton? All that good stuff. Um, but what we sort of overlaid that with was to say, look, where's all the information? Like, where's, like, you know, where's the phone book? And because of um, the kind of work we had already done with uh, the, the database work we had done with, uh, uh, with, with the parts of the UN, we were really well positioned to structure and make sense of, like, very confusing uh, data sets that format and then look and like basically make sense of spaghetti of data. <laughs> and so that's how Allied Offsets got started. And we basically said, how can we, within the voluntary carbon markets, how can we um, get as much information together as we can? Um, and we now have oh, a chance all the time, but I think we have 25, 26,000 projects from 21 registries. Uh, and I think five, six, seven hundred projects that are not on registries, which is mainly the CDR ones. Um, and then we, because we have all that data and sort of structured it, so it at least makes sense in our little heads. But we're now able to put a lot of data and analysis on top of that data, which some people find useful, sort of like across projects, across geographies, methodologies. Um, you can say, well, you know, who is doing what? What uh, what prizes are they paying? What have they therefore spent? How does that compare to their scope and missions? You can really go to town on a lot of analysis. But most most importantly, we then have made a, all of that data more easily accessible to others. So if you think of us as trying to be on a good day, we'd call ourselves on uh, Bloomberg. On a bad day, you'd say we're sort of the phone book phone book plus i guess um but that's how we how uh frankly my background and and uh and how allied assets came came to be and yeah we we obviously have particularly in the last 18 months seen the space go um absolutely through the shitter uh because of uh, primarily all these issues around credibility which has been extra fun for us or fun as well because we've seen a lot of our clients get hurt by it. But, you know, to give you an idea, a lot of the, 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 the project managers are clients, but so are the, some of the oil majors, but so is Greenpeace and, and the Guardian are clients. And so we've had multiple cases where the Guardian shits all over someone that's bought some credits and the, whoever's bought the credits might be our clients and the Guardian's are clients. But I kind of think, well, at least they agree on what the data is, you know. Um, they then disagree on the conclusions, and sometimes we certainly don't agree with all all our clients say. Um, but but at least there is now like a, a common set of what are we looking at, and then we can disagree on on, on a lot of other stuff. But um, that gives you an idea of the kind of kind of things we do. Um, we're very focused on price. You know what what are these um, what do these credits actually trade at? Um, we're very co focused on aggregating. We, we get ratings from five different eight ratings agencies and lots of other stuff. So that gives kind of an overview of, of, of who I am, who we are, and, and what we do. And uh, for what it's worth, we're, um, oh, I keep saying three weeks, so let's call it four weeks today, but we're about, we have about a month away from publishing uh, some work we have done on the supply of credits in the market, which I think is a very misunderstood thing. Um, and I know you guys are very focused on the CDR space, so I'll come to why it's, it's very relevant for that. But the whole concept of, you know, what, what at various prices, expected future prices for, for carbon credits, what can actually be supplied into the market? And that obviously depends on what type of credit it is, where it is, et cetera, et cetera. But we're building this very elaborate model where you say, well, at different prices, what is actually the gross supply of additional credits you can come up with and can you prove that those are of, of the kind of quality you need to be able to prove that they are uh, in, in order to, to, to sell them and and most importantly how does that stack up against sort of the future SBTI commitments or you know basic well think of it as future demand and how sensitive is that demand to change in price and how sensitive it is to perceive quality and and what we're finding and this is one of the key 
reasons why we're pretty bullish when when the market is in such a horrible state. Uh, but what we're finding is there's definitely a low price carbon. I'm going to say low price called called below twenty five bucks a ton. Um, there is definitely a finite supply, which is a simple way to think of it. Is you know there are only so many cook stoves in the world, and only so many potential forest projects in the world. You know methane capture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and uh, if you can believe um, that 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 day will come, but that's a provable quality. It is still a basically rounding era set of uh, you know, carbon credits coming to the market as a fraction of the, the the sort of latent demand from corporates and others. And I think that's incredibly interesting because that suggests that there is some possibility that the prices will absolutely rip um, because there is uh, the, 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 the ability to keep supplying credits at below twenty five uh, dollars is eventually very limited and that's where you get into the cdr space which depending on how you define you know by charge some of the others are you know maybe 4x that price so so you know we're, we're working hard on that but it's just one of the things we just kind of love working on so sorry that was very long-winded i'll i'll, I'll shut up now there's no 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 it's uh it's very welcome um uh, i'm glad you shared so much of uh of what you do and i'm really glad you mentioned the guardian actually Especially with regard to to carbon prices and carbon project, because I don't I don't know if you know this, but last year, like at the very end of December, I believe there was a, a new pub paper published, which uh, kind of completely debunked the Guardian's investigation, and you know, which really cast a shadow on the VCM throughout all of 2023, basically. So there's this new paper with like yeah, from like scientists from NASA and MIT and, and God knows what also. So yeah, that was kind of a positive end. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, I think I think the main problem with the Guardian stuff is that the megaphone of the Guardian is a hundred times larger than the megaphone of the voluntary carbon market. Yeah, you know, there are lots of people that have I think some very convincingly debunked the work of the Guardian journalists, but you know that then goes on LinkedIn to your two thousand followers. When the Guardian writes something, it's the first thing the CEO of a would-be buyer knows to read, and you don't want to be called out by the Guardian, and you can't point to, you know, a LinkedIn post by you know some some scientist or by someone in the carbon market as you know, oh it's now been, you know, certifiably debunked. So I think that's why the Guardian and the likes of the Guardian, you know, there's also the people that, you know basically ran all over South Pole, right? That yeah, you know, that was in New York, uh, the New Yorker magazine, and you know, that's been the Wall Street Journal. So these very, very large global publications matters a lot more what they say uh than 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 what the carbon voluntary carbon markets say. So that's why I think we still have a problem. But of course it's great news that this is debunkable. Now it, the question really is it debunkable to the point where the Guardian, at risk of a lawsuit, uh, withdraws their articles and does correction pieces, saying, well, actually, we were wrong. And that hasn't happened. Right? So if you think of a, it sounds like a, an absurd example, but let's say that the Guardian published an article tomorrow saying, you know, did you realize that your uh, Apple computer is made by child labor in China? Well, you know, that article would be pulled down within 30 minutes because it was provably wrong and it would be liable. And you better believe the Guardian, if they <laughs> didn't, you know, the Apple would come after them in a hell of a hurry unless the Guardian had really solid proof that that was in fact the case. Yeah. Well, they, they based their investigation on science that was available at the time as well. Just it's now it's new science that, yeah, you know. Exactly. But I think this is where it's interesting, right? Because you're absolutely right. There should be um, a sort of shared facts. There should be a some some data, some science that can prove that these credits are real, and then there should be a way to disprove convincingly what the Guardian says. And if there is, it's great news for the space. It's the best news ever, right? Because that goes effectively to say we can prove that a ton is a ton, and if a ton is a ton, and you can pay five dollars for it. Are you kidding me? Let's just say we can all agree that to a, a, a standard of proof that, say, meets the same standards as, I don't know, audited financial accounts, right? So 
let's say we agreed that that credit that I can sell to you for five dollars or a project developer can sell to you for five dollars meets that standard. Everyone can agree that we should rather do twenty of that than one compliance credit that currently costs about a hundred bucks. Right? So when British Airways goes into the compliance market and 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 um, buys a ton to because they didn't meet their emissions target and they pay hundred dollars for that ton, you know, eventually, if it was as provable that that five dollar ton was as good or as was as certain to be one ton of actual carbon, uh, then then yeah, of course we should rather do that. And that would go a long way towards solving climate change. That's not what's happened in the last 18 months. I agree with you that um, A, it would be the best thing ever for the industry, but it's also beginning to be that kind of, kind of uh, you know, uh, I, well, famous last words, but I wouldn't be surprised at the bottom has. You know, we, we've seen the bottom of the volunteer car market and things are beginning to come back. It'd be great, great news for the space. I personally also believe it. But, but I think what in any case is very helpful is that the, anyone who starts a carbon project now, whether it's a CDR or a, a traditional VCM project, if you don't think you have to be able to prove that a ton is a ton to the standard of the guardian calling you up and asking you to prove it, then you're just crazy. Because of course you should expect that level of proof. Traditionally, I don't think that's happened. Some of the old CDM credits um, are probably not to that standard. If we're all being honest, and some of the old stuff just isn't. Some of the newer stuff, yeah, they all know they like, you can't prove it to that standard. You're not going to get a lot of money for your credits. So don't do it. Um, and but I think that's very very possible. So yeah, I'm 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 a huge optimist. And I also think, what else are we going to do? We're going to stop flying planes. Are we going to tell Putin to? Throw fewer bombs. Like, what you, you know, it's just didn't wasn't last year like the largest emissions on, in history or something? Was, uh, close to it, anyhow, right? So as much as we go to COP and we say, oh, everyone's got a green solution to everything, like, yeah, it's just not getting there, right? So the offset market, it's a tiny part, but in that it can contribute, it can become a very very substantial part. And I think as much as, but of course, we need to be able to prove that a ton is a ton. Like where else have you had a successful industry where you can't actually prove that the product you're selling is what you're saying it is? Like, you know, if you go to the supermarket and buy a pint of milk, you can prove that it's a pint and you can prove that it's milk, right? So you don't really have to check it every time because you know it's very provable. And if we can get to the standard that, uh, you know, when we say something is a ton of carbon, it's actually a ton of carbon, this space will explode and it'll do the world a ton of good. There'll be a lot of local communities that sound good also, uh, sort of almost on the side. And if we can't do that, then we should get to the point where we can do that. That's how I feel. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm an optimist. Yeah, absolutely. I think the bottom's been reached. And I'd say, uh, you know, my old world of PE or investors, I started telling them, you should look at investing in some of these projects. Like, if you can create projects that can like had had have a like, generated return for their investors at a price of say five to seven dollars a ton yeah, absolutely you should do that because let's just for a minute think what happens to that return on capital if the price is twenty dollars a ton it's staggering what if it's fifty dollars a ton you're gonna make out like a bandit and right right now that's like that hasn't happened the last four or five years. A lot of people are sitting with massive, sometimes unrealized losses, right? And and and, but if you believe that this bottom has been reached, yeah, it, it can fly, and I hope so. I also think there's there's good reason to think that it will. So yeah, but of course we got to be able to prove that a ton is a ton. Yeah. How how quickly do you see um, prices starting to rise and rise rapidly? I don't know. It's hard to say. You know, we've done one thing which um, I'm happy to share with all your listeners. We've done this, um, what we call sentiment analysis. And so what sentiment is, we've done it two ways, actually. One is where we, you know, we know we have a database of, I want to say, eight or 9,000 corporates. What have they retired? Which credits? Um, what, have, what do we think they pay? How does that come, uh, stack up against their emissions and so forth? But what's kind of interesting is you can keep track in you know, the trailing 12 months how many people have retired credits. The reason that's interesting is it just gives you a sense of how many corporates are net coming into the market or exiting the market. Right. So if I told you in the last 12 months to today, 
you know, whatever, 3,000 companies have retired credits. And, but in the, the last 12 months till September 1, it was uh, 3,600. Well, that suggests that 600 companies net have exited the market. That's not great. But what we're finding is that stopped happening. So people are coming into the market more than exiting the market. And the average size of the emissions of those that have come into the market is higher. That's a good thing for, 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 for sentiment, suggesting more and bigger companies are coming back into the market. You know, is that a predictor? It turns out it is a pretty decent predictor of sort of the, the, the one month later price. Um, so that's one way we're tracking. We have sort of a bunch of parameters. We look into them, what kind of credits are they buying? So the other thing is we did this, and, and if anyone wants to be a part of it, uh, I'd welcome it. But we do this thing where we have a, it's a, a number uh, of professionals from the space where we send them an email every week and they, you know, how do you feel about the market between one and 10? You know, a little bit like when you go through the airport and you have to like, how happy are you with the service? Kind of you bang, you know, one of those smiley faces. So think of it like one of those, but just there's 10 smiley faces all the way down to a really angry one. And they just, you know, send a number and they say three or five or six or whatever they say. And then we aggregate that and average it out and eliminate the highest and the lowest, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a professional sentiment score. Um, and then we, as a, because they do that to us, we send them the result immediately. And um, that's pretty cool, right? Because that, that's a very good indicator of how is the space, how does the space feel about the space? Um, and that's also starting to, what we've seen the last couple of months, started to bottom that. I actually think that those two indicators together are a pretty good predictor of, you know, are things going to get worse? And I did, so I feel somewhat comfortable that they're going to get better. <laughs> I know how qualified that sounds, by the way. But. Well, I think you're probably the most qualified person to, to talk about that, given the amount of data you have access to. Look, I think, look, isn't it just on the face of it? There are credits out there now, and, and, and ignoring quality for a second, which I know we can't. But let's, if you're not quality for a second, I told you, you can buy credits that someone is going to look you straight in the eye and say, this is a ton of carbon, and I'm selling it to you for $2. And you're like, hmm, that sure sounds cheap. <laughs> but then, and then you realize that Purdue is spending $100, and there are lots of places in the world where the tax regimes are way above $2. and TDR credits are trading at whatever, hundreds of dollars, right? Sometimes very high number. Now, it's almost like, well, what gives? Is everyone else just stupid and the $2 is like the biggest steal ever? Or is there some sort of a discount because of perceived quality? Or is it because, you know, what's wrong almost like, right? And are you missing an obvious trick? Um, and I think uh, if that $2 credit is convincingly provable that it is in fact two dollars then um yeah it's, it could go very high very quick right because the alternatives are way 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 more expensive they're more credible so right uh, the cdr is considered way more credible in terms of their provability and obviously the compliance market is too but but that's what i'm saying so we could get these credits up the curve of being believed then there's a lot of upside there's also by the way a couple of things i just want to mention um you look at all the ratings, so we have access to all the ratings, the uh, KVX, the Silvera, the B0s, et cetera, et cetera. So the um, Stainacraft and Renasta, I think, are the five. Um, and also at Beta will do a lot of really good work on this. Um, but um, they, uh, yeah, one of the issues in this space is they don't agree among themselves, right? So, so if you look at the ratings, rating the projects they rate, there's a fair amount of overlap because they all try to rate the biggest projects. They don't agree among themselves. It'd be a little bit like you know, uh, you know, S and P and Moody's rating a General Electric bond, and one says F and one says A. And you're like, what am I gonna? What what you know? What what do I do now? Do I rate the raters? That's one issue. The second issue is there is this is something we've done a lot of work on. We aggregate all the um, the various tax regimes around the world. So I, I don't hold. I want to say it was 18 in our database, maybe. It's, uh, I wish Pundi was here. He's the one. Is it 18? Uh, 15 to 18 tax regimes, right? And basically, uh, you know, so, so 
as an example, you know, South Korea has a regime where certain types of credits is eligible for a certain amount of your compliance credits. Now, so even just tagging projects where that applies is very, very valuable. That's something we do, right? So if I tell you certain types of vintages for certain projects are eligible for the tag regimes, then um, it's almost, I think it flies a little bit in the face of the Raiders sometimes because it's almost like saying, well, I don't, I don't care what the Raiders say. The South Korean government says it's good enough. Right? So that's, that's its own uh, set of issues there. Um, but um, yeah, and that's again, there's one of those like, who should gather that data? And I think it's people like us. Some of our peers do it too, I'm sure. But like, now where else do you find the place where you can see which credits are eligible for which stack regime and which vintages? And that, by the way, changes all the time. Right. So, so um, you know, you can't. That's you know, you probably shouldn't be active in the market unless you know that, right? Because the man you're trading credits with someone who does know that and you don't, there's a very good chance you're going to get taken for a ride. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. Speaking of like standardizations and, and rating agencies and such, I also wanted to pick your brain on Article 6 because a lot of people tend to have very differing opinions on, on that, at least in my experience. You know that there was no agreement reached at COP28 on Article 6.2 and Article 6.2 four of the Paris Agreement. So do you believe this will hinder the development of the carbon markets or affect it in any way at all? Struggle how to think about Article 6 um, because uh, I think there are so many uh, questions that are very, very important that sort of to be determined, but the success of the scheme will, will depend on and how those things get determined. One of the things is, you know, if you look at voluntary carbon projects, it's the whole idea is if you're the government, uh, is it get on? They always mention as someone that's like actually gone all in into the Article Six stuff. So let's just say that Gabon has, you know, a net sequestration of say 100 credits. Just pick one, and now you and I create a carbon project in Gabon that, uh, uh, you know, whatever we say, it's five credits. Now, does that go into Gabon? Does it get owned by the government? Or can we actually sell those five credits? In other words, is it part now of Gabon, Gabon's score? And how many of those fives do we get to keep? Um, in some cases, that's a little bit unclear exactly who decides that and the process for deciding. And I know in some cases, uh, the, the, the registries have started tagging the projects. But if I'm an investor into a carbon project in Gabon, I'd want to be really, really sure that I actually get to keep those credits or I'm never going to invest in the first place. Right? That's, that just seems insane. Uh, the second thing is like, who like, did Gabon get to save these hundred dollars and where did that money go? Um, you know, uh, so did these hundred credits, like was that the government of Gabon, which uh, no offense to Gabon, but certain, certain governments don't have a long history of, uh, you know, it's just a reliable and good data management. Um, and this is an incredibly complex thing to get right and, and centralized. Then I'd also say it's, you know, uh, um, uh, it seems to me that the, the issue is uh, yeah, we're a long way from these kind of uh, Switzerland buying Gabon credits to be of any kind of size where it hurts the taxpayers or corporates in Switzerland. Like we're miles from that. And for this system to work, we eventually have to get to a point where there's a tremendous transfer of wealth from the emitters to the Gabons of this world. And I think that's gonna be a very, very tough nut to crack, an important one to crack. But um, there's just a lot of outstanding issues that don't have easy answers. And men that go into to, you know, people that like driving big SUVs in Texas and selling them, well, guess what? You're all driving electric cars from now on and you're sending a lot of money to get on. You know, that's one surefire way to make sure you're not going to be elected next time around. But eventually, we're gonna, I mean, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but there's some issues there that obviously are, are critical and, um, and, and, uh, and I, I, they're going to, they're going to like how that gets resolved. is going to impact the VCM. That's something we study very, very closely and, I think we're going to start tagging countries to say, well, how do they feel about all this stuff? Uh, but, you know, I think the, the, the issue with a lot of the carbon, global carbon markets in general, it's very easy to shoot down solutions for being unrealistic or imprecise or hard to prove. But 
yeah, I don't think you should get to shoot down something until you come with a better alternative or a solution. Um, because what, what are we going to do? Just keep doing what we've been doing. That that'd be insane, right? So uh, yeah, yeah. So I I think there's a lot of confusion. I I think a lot of people had uh, well, obviously I had big hopes for COP that didn't quite come through. Um, I know some of the people that are. I mean, we talked to a bunch of the Article 6 folks. I know some of them are struggling because the big transactions aren't really happening and who exactly gets to take credit for what. It's also hasn't really transpired in the way I think people hoped. Um, but, and I also know, at least in my mind, maybe I'm being unfair, but some of the Article 6, I call them that, by the way, instead of calling them out. But some of the Article 6 had been, I think, unnecessarily denigrating of the voluntary carbon market saying it's small, irrelevant, and all shit. And I think that's probably one great way to make sure that no one wants to work with you. <laughs> but, um, and I also don't think that's true. There are very good reasons that it's small and historically it's been not as good as it can be, but I think the market is trying to remedy that. And, you know, it'll probably need some regulatory help in some way. Right? But yeah, so I know I didn't answer your question, but I don't think there is a great answer. Well, while we're still on on the subject of COP twenty eight, maybe maybe you can share with us your impression of how much attention carbon markets in general were getting there, or like carbon removal even. Yeah, look, so I okay, so let me try. To, so we, I'm very excited about a CDR, uh, and uh, I actually originally the reason we started um, spending a lot of re- so I, I'm just going to make a statement that I'm sure you get some of your friends will say he's just crazy. We have the best and most complete database in the car, in the CDR space. That that's the standard I want you to hold me to. Right? If that's not true, tell me that it's not true, and we can get there. Okay, so that's the standard you're going to hold me to. We have the best data in the world in the CDR space. Now, why is C- why is CDR so important? So, very rough numbers. This is very 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 rough. So, I you can't hold me to it. Rough. The the, the VTM market is about zero point two whatever zero point three percent of global emissions so it's rounding it the cdr space is what 0.1 percent of that so it's like the rounding error of a rounding error right it's like it's nowhere so why is this so interesting it's interesting because uh so far at least a lot of the cdr projects haven't suffered from the credibility issues that the the, the traditional vcm market has it's not like the guardian's writing articles about the ac technologies that are just like capturing nothing but they're obviously ridiculously expensive, but it's obviously the big hope is in the scalability of this technology. Um, I'm, the, I'm on the board of the Institute of Carbon Management. I have a project called uh, Aquatic. I'd encourage anyone to look at. Very, very simplistically, they, they, they generate carbon from a mix of, you know, there's some byproducts, but there's a mix of salt water and, and sun, right? So <laughs> I think we can all agree that that's two things that the world has enough of. And let's just say that a miracle cure happens and uh, these guys come up with a way to do this at, I don't know, $100 a ton, right? Let's say it's, uh, which, which is not the case right now, but let's say they did. Uh, and that's obviously cost of energy and basic physics and so forth. But let's just say they did. Or someone else smarter than the guys I know, which is pretty high bar, by the way, but um, found a way to do that. So now you have a solution that in principle is unlimited scale. And uh, I eat it salt water and 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 solar power, uh, and and let's just say you could also capture and store the carbon or make it somehow miraculously go away. Now, for a hundred dollars a ton, you solve climate change. That's like a miracle, right? Whoever came up with that should be richer than 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 Warren Buffett or Elon Musk or whoever's the richest one around today, um, because they have now priced climate change as insane as that sounds. That's just never going to happen in the VCM. A, because is it actually provable that a ton is a ton? And B, because there are only so many cook stoves, right? We're never going to, like, that's not going to get us anywhere remotely near the kind of yeah, emissions reduction or, or, or you know, capture that the world needs. Not in a million years. But these CDR technologies, some of them have the scalability that the traditional VCM does not, and it doesn't yet suffer from, from the credibility issues. I think that might change down the road. But of course, anything should be able to, anything you pay a lot of money for, you should meet the standard of you actually able to prove that it's on its own. Again, think of the, the pint of milk. <laughs> you should be able to prove that it is what you say it is. Now, 
That's why CDR is so interesting. A lot of these projects happen at research universities around the world. So we, by the way, we, we create a database also of who owns all the patents. Seems like obvious, right? But like, how can you not know that? Like all these technologies that call, I think we have eight subsectors of CDR. And this, by the way, the, the work, yeah, I mean, oh, this is stuff we're working together. We're publishing together, uh, um, you know, a report on what are all these things and where do they sit and who owns the patents and who's actually buying the credits. So in other words, if you one of the things that happens to up a lot, we, we, we get these projects getting in touch and like, do you know who buys these things? <laughs> we're like, yeah, here's a list. There's a list of 30 corporates that have bought CDR credits and paid a lot of money for it. And, you know, that's, you know, or is it, uh, uh, an ever-expanding list, let's put it that way. And here's another list of who invests in this stuff. And if you're interested in licensing the technology, here's another list. If you're a cement company, shouldn't you know what are all the latest and greatest things that happen in, like, cement storage technology? I mean, how could you not know that? Right? And there's a list. And, 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 and. You know, that's the kind of stuff I think is really, really cool in CDR issues. Of course, price is expensive. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. And um, I'm glad you did mention the report. And that is why I do believe that Allied Offsets has exceptional data because we are working, Carbon Herald and Allied Offsets is working on um, on publishing a report on the CDR market in general, which it's not quite ready yet. By the time these, the episode airs, it will certainly be available and there will be a, a link for it in the description. Um, basically, the main things there are, are pricing of CDR and uh, the analysis of demand in the market, as well as something which is very interesting, which you touched on this, like CDR within the broader VCM, its position there, policy, risks, competition, all of that. So who who would you say, yeah, would benefit from it the most from a report like that? The CDR? You know, I think I think it's uh like well, all right, so so I think the, hopefully the world, right? If the prices come down to a point where um um you know that where it's as provable as some of the compliance stuff, but also as like comparable in price and scalable. Um so, yeah, so the, I think these projects, some of the ones that 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 do the you know come up with good solutions, will make just an absolute staggering amount of money. A lot of them, it'll probably be like a venture capital model where a lot of them are going to fail, but the few that succeed succeed massively. So, I think some of the corporates that are getting in early will have a head start. They will know this market. They will know the players. They'll have sometimes a very long off tick agreements, but also, you know, knowing the technologies and have an intimate understanding of them. Um, don't know if it's public, so I won't say who, but like a very, very large, well-known brand bought a bunch of credits for these, these aquatic guys. And, you know, they were extremely uh, well-versed in exactly how the technology works and how they can apply it elsewhere in their, in their business. So I think, you know, let's not forget that one of the huge benefits of the ZDR market is that you know they're trying to address an incredibly important problem, and you know how do you capture and store CO two? Right? The, the, you know, that's something we can all. Well, most people would agree that that's something the world needs. So, I hope that the huge amount of investments going into the CDR space will continue. And I have every faith that you know, some of the functioning of the markets and a bunch of well incentivized, brilliant scientists will come up with the best answers that are potentially available. So one of the reasons I worry about too much government intervention, I don't think that's a good, you know, I think this should be an incredibly agile and uh, space. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I believe that's how the best innovations will be brought up, not by someone at the UN making allocations. I worry like a little bit what that could mean in terms of the, the, the some of the Article 6 stuff, but I don't know. It's hard to tell, right? It's all so much in flux, but I do think it's a very good thing that people are putting money into these technologies, and I hope it continues. I hope, like, you know, we're doing this thing for cement companies. That's why I keep it. But even think of any building company. Like, can you store uh, carbon? They're all under pressure. They're doing more green infrastructure projects, and you know, they at least know what it costs, right? What does it cost not to buy the credits, but to apply the technologies in your production? And um, you know, even the fact that that's something that's that that they should be looking at as a positive for the space, because that's like very very real money. And um, yeah, there's a lot of that out. There. So I'm, I'm 
I'm positive, but we need to get on with it because it's still time and it's still very expensive. Yeah, well, hopefully fast enough. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that uh, I'd like to ask you before we wrap up this episode is what's in the pipeline for Allied Offsets? Are there any future plans or upcoming events that, that you can disclose? No, I mean, we're a funny business. We often get asked, why, why, are, you, why are you the way you are? But, you know, we've never, ra- we've never raised money from anyone. Um, uh, one of our peers, Trove, got bought by MSCI last year. So it's obviously a match of people ask us, what are your thoughts? But I'd say one of the things we really love is we, we sit around and we talk about what we find fascinating and we, we, we run towards what we find is more in, most interesting. And it creates like a really cool work atmosphere. And I think that ultimately benefits our clients. Like we don't have like a, you know, what does the market really need in the next three years? And let's do only that. We have obviously some of that, but also an overlay of what do we think is most interesting given all this data we have access to, all this knowledge we have access to. So we're working on, in the next uh, little while, I mentioned the supply model. Um, I mentioned this regulatory thing is going to make a big difference. Just an overview of of, 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 of what's where. Uh, we're about to publish a tradable index. I can bore you to tears with why that's actually potentially very, very important. Um, and and But they, they all have in common that... Uh, we're trying to, through our work, lower the, as you say, lower the cost, information cost of the space, and making it easier to operate in the in the in the, in the, the voluntary carbon market space. And I sort of see the R in there by finding, understanding, exploring, analyzing everything, and that will be very helpful towards mitigating climate change. And that's our role in it. Um, what that means for us as a corporate is not something that dominates our life because, again, we don't have investors that say, oh, can I see a quarterly update? And I know some of my friends in this space, that's like half their day or all of their days talking to past investors and future investors. And we don't have any of that, which I think is net positive. And, of course, sometimes it means we don't get the feedback loop we otherwise would get. But, but um yeah, I enjoy that when, when you and I hang up now, I'm going to be working on a big Python model and not talking to giving a quarterly update to a bunch of investors. That's like how we like to spend our days. So I know it's privileged, but it's, it's also pretty cool. And we love what we do. This is such a great space. I encourage anyone who's like peripherally interested in the space, like this can be the next, next thing. If you're looking at your career, it, it, it's a great mix of sustainability, technology, there's even the development angle, and there's certainly a finance and technology angle. So if you look at like young people leaving the likes of McKinsey and Goldman today, this is not a bad place to look in terms of what's going to be a driver of growth in your career the next five, 10 years, but also what's going to provide a lot of meaning in, in your daily life. And that's pretty cool. It's not a bad mix. Yeah, there's certainly um, a tendency in the past couple of years for young people moving out of big tech companies, for example, and directing their their efforts, their expertise towards climate. I agree. I mean, and it's like you could do a lot worse, right? It's, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's obviously, you know, don't forget prices in the VCM went down like, what, 80% in the last two years. So a lot of people were didn't immediately take off in the way they have, but I'd say keep the faith because we haven't come up with a better alternative for now. And there's a lot of movement in this space. There's also a lot of hype. A lot of companies are probably going to run out of money at some point, but that's that's almost like the internet, right? The early days, <laughs> it was like the, the first nuclear winter. And maybe that's sort of a rite of passage we also have to go through. Perhaps. But we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Um, Lars, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this wonderful conversation today and uh, share so much of what you know about the, the state of the carbon market. Thank you so much for joining us. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yes, it was great to talk to you. And I wish you a very exciting and successful 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this episode of the Carbon Stations podcast and would like to hear more conversations like this, please be sure to subscribe. We really appreciate the support.